I want to begin by looking just briefly at a passage in Jeremiah chapter 12. In this passage, Jeremiah is offering a complaint to God about the triumph of the wicked. The wicked seem to prosper. He seems to be suffering. He wants an answer from God. And God responds to him in chapter 12, verse 5. If you have run with footmen and they have tired you out, then how can you compete with horses? If you fall down in the land of peace, how will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? Now, what is he teaching here? He's saying, Jeremiah, it's going to get worse. It's going to get far worse than what you can imagine at this moment. And Jeremiah, if in this slightly difficult time, you are not able to run, you are not able to stand, then you most certainly will not be able to run or stand when times get tough. Now, something very important, especially I, I'm addressing everyone, but especially the young men today. You were not born in a culture or a generation that creates strength. You were born in a culture and a generation that has sought to create nothing but weakness in you. Lack of conviction, lack of the ability to plant your feet in the sand and go against everyone for the cause of Christ. Your generation teaches you nothing of that. And right now, right now. If you find it difficult to walk with Christ now. Then fear. I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet. This is not from some vision or even an interpretation of scripture. This is from just being a student of history. If there is not a revival in this country. And you do stand as a Christian. And I mean stand then your generation may suffer far more than any generation that's ever been on this continent. And if you're weak now, you will cave then. Question is, what should we do? What should we do? Well, I can tell you what you shouldn't do. You don't need to go back into previous generations and find some sort of model of John Wayne or a cowboy or a soldier and then draw your example from that. No, you must do what every generation must do if it's going to be strong in the Lord and serve the Lord and honor the Lord. You're going to have to live in Scripture. I so often hear these young men talking and talking and talking and talking and talking and talking, but they cannot stand. And they do not stand because they do not kneel in the study of Scripture and in prayer. A young man and a young woman that spends time in prayer before a holy God that lives Feeds upon the word of God can stand when everyone else falls. So the question is this. You're going to play Christianity. You're going to get in all sorts of groups and have all kinds of fun. Or are you going to be that person who gets in the word of God and grows? Who gets in the word of God and becomes conformed to the image of Christ? That's the question. I can tell you that when I was at the University of Texas, countless brothers around me, countless brothers going out, doing things, being part of Christian organizations. And now after more than 35 years, I look around and most of them are completely gone. Back into the world. Why? Christianity is difficult. It is not going with the stream, it's going against the stream. It is a fight. It is a fight just to walk in the convictions of Scripture. How much more is it a fight 
when you decide that it's not all about you and it's not all about your family, but it's about four billion people who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you decide to put on soldiers boots and fight to give your life to something. Yes, some of you here today who are very devoted, very godly, you also need to understand something. This is not just about your piety and this is not just about you getting your family to heaven. This is bigger than you, bigger than your family. It is about taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world, no matter how it hurts or what it costs. That's what it's about. And I can tell you, I see so many young men wasting their strength in foolishness, just outright childishness. Instead of becoming men. And thinking about taking the gospel to the world of dying for Christ. I was just with a brother recently and we were laughing together. I said, well, brother, I just hope your jail cell is beside mine. I would love the fellowship. It may come to that. But so be it. We must be strong, but we can't be strong based on personality. We can't be strong just based on some silly experience at a conference. We are only as strong as the time we spend before God in his word and in prayer. That's what makes us strong. Joshua has to enter into the promised land. He has to fight bloody, horrible battles. What is he told to do? To gather up all the arms, to get blacksmiths to start creating weapons? No, he's told to meditate upon the word of the living God. And that would make him strong and courageous. The young men in 1 John, they were strong. Why? Because the word of God indwelt them. Indwelt them. So now, let's go to the book of Romans. Chapter 12. Now, if you notice up here, it also had Psalms 1 earlier. And that is because as I study more and more through the scriptures, I am astounded at the constant relationship I am finding between either the, the sayings of Christ, the writings of Paul and the Old Testament. And when you look at Romans chapter 12, in a sense, we're seeing a New Testament version of Psalms one. Now. He says in verse one, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Now, he is asking of you. Everything. Everything, not a few hours a week. Not that you just give up some sin. He is telling you to give the most costly thing you can possibly give. And that is your entire life. That's what he demands. Recall now all those teachings of Christ. The man who gains his life loses it. The man who loses his life for my sake is the man who finds life. This is a call to die. You're all probably familiar with Jim Elliott. And um, one day after his martyrdom. A friend flew over the site, over the beach where he had been martyred. And the pilot said, uh, right down there is where Jim died. And Jim's friend said, no, it wasn't. Pilot goes, yes, it was. I was here. I drove the plane. I, I picked up the body right there is where Jim died. He said, no, it wasn't. I was with Jim when he died. In a little church several years ago. When he offered his life to Christ. When did you die? Where's your tombstone? God is calling us to offer our lives to him. Offer our lives to him. Now, we need to ask ourselves a very important question. What could be the motivation for this? What could cause a man to do something this radical. Well, we have a few here and then I'm going to take you in a few other places in the in the New Testament 
and show you what can drive a man to do this. First of all, in the immediate, most immediate context, if you look, it says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Now, the word therefore is very important because it's connecting us to what precedes and what proceeds immediately is one of the most glorious statements in the entire Bible. Verse 36, for from him and through him and to him are all things. What is he saying? From God, God is the author, the architect and designer of absolutely everything. This is all his doing. It all originated with him. It is his plan. Every place you go, everything you see. It's because he planned it. He's the architect of it. So it says, for from him are all things and through him. Not only is he the primary cause of everything that is, but he's the agent, the effective agent through which that occurs. Everything that is. Exists because not only did God call it into being, but God sustains it. If God, we are not deist, if God were to turn away for just a fraction of a moment from this planet, it would dissolve into nothingness and chaos. He's the primary cause. He's the effective cause. And then he goes on to say this. To him are all things. He is the end cause, the final cause. He is in Latin, the sunum bonum, the greatest good. He is the reason why everything was made. Everything is even events. Every event that ever happened has been orchestrated in some way by God for the ultimate purpose of displaying his attributes to the to the entire universe. That he might be worshipped as God. Now. Based on that. When this kind of God says, give yourself to me. The God who originated you, designed you. Who through his mediation brought you into being. And for whom you were created. See, that's that whole passage in Romans 323. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't mean this simply that God has this glorious purpose for you and you need to find it. And when you find it, you'll feel good about yourself. No, what he's saying is you weren't made for you. You were made for him and only him, exclusively him. I wasn't made for my wife. My wife wasn't made for me. My daughter wasn't made for me. We were made for God. By God, for God. And when God calls. And he does. To every human being, but especially his people. They are to say, yes, Lord. As I, Isaiah said, yes, Lord, here am I. Take my life and let it be. Consecrated, Lord, to thee. I'm yours. Every beat of the heart, every breath, every fiber, and Lord, every beat of the heart and every breath and every fiber that does not serve thee, then let it be accursed. I hate it. It is all for you. But now there's another motivation. That was immediate context in the extended context of the book of Romans. We see another motivation why we should stop playing games. And give our lives to God. What is it? He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. His mercies. His undeserved kindnesses lead us to give ourselves to him. And what are those mercies that Paul is talking about? Well, again, the preposition, therefore, he's linking chapter 12 to the first 11, first 11 chapters. 
And in the first 11 chapters, what do we have? The gospel of Jesus Christ. The universal sinfulness of all of mankind. Chapter one, chapter two, that the Jews are under the same guilt. Chapter three, Gentile and Jew, all condemned by the law of God because there is none good. No, not one. And then what? The end of chapter three. Christ. Grace. The death of the only begotten son on behalf of a sinful race. That the justice of God. Might be appeased. And the wrath of God extinguished. And all the grace and tender mercies of God might rightfully be poured out on his people. Why do we give our life to him? Because he died for us. There's a young, used to be young man that I know very, very well. Who was riotous and popular and came to know Christ. And a few days later, where he used to be the star of the show, he's standing in the middle of the university with tracks, handing them out and telling people Jesus loves you. When his friends grabbed him and pulled him into a side room, he said, what are what are you doing? Have you lost your mind? He died for me was the only response from that young man. And I know him. If you talk to him now, 35 years later, why? Why do you work so hard? Why do you do this? He died for me. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died. And then he died for me. That's why I despise Contemporary evangelicalism and its party and its entertainment and everything else it needs to attract people because apparently Jesus is not enough. Well, he is enough to his people. He is enough. Now, I want to just run over to one of my favorite people, the Apostle Paul. And second Corinthians, and I want to look at another motivation. Actually, the same one, he says in chapter five. Verse 13. You see, some people in Corinth were saying Paul was out of his mind. Yes, he was an intellectual. Yes, he was a brilliant man. Yes, he was a scholar in many rights. But have you seen him sometimes? He will just Go too far in this willingness to die, this willingness to suffer, this hard stance he takes, not willing to back up, always going forward, refusing to compromise. And what did they say about him? Look at verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves, that's what they were saying. Oh, we'll give you Paul. The, the guy's dedicated. He, he just takes it too far. He says, if we are beside ourselves. It is for God. It's for him. Really, do you honestly think that a man who is on fire, a woman who is on fire for God is actually going to be honored by this filthy, stinking, fallen world? Do you think you can have it both ways? Do you think a person who's truly going to walk with Christ is even going to be honored in this evangelical community of dance and fun? No. Paul said, OK, you say I'm a madman, then just know this. I'm a madman for him and I'm not ashamed of it. 
And then he goes, if we are of sound mind, it is for you. Yes, toward him, I'm a madman, but toward you, I'm saying, I teach you, you know, my word. It's validated. And then he goes on. Here's the, here's the point for the love of Christ controls us. Controls us, constrains us, drives us, drives us. Now you're thinking, oh, Paul's great love for Christ drove him. No, that's not what Paul's saying. You've got the genitive backwards here. Paul is not saying my great love for Christ compels me. Because no man's love is consistent, not even Paul's. What's he saying then? He's saying this, Christ's magnificent, enduring, immutable love for me drives me. Do you see the difference? How are you doing today? Well, I'm pretty up. No, I'm down. Well, I'm up again. I'm down. And so goes also your labor for Christ. But if you sit there and realize this is not about my love for him, it's about his love for me. I will meditate on his love for me. And be driven by that. Ah, everything changes. Because it doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't even matter how spiritual I am this day. His love is the same. It continues driving, driving. And his love drives harder than any whip I've ever felt across my back. And then one more ambition, one more motive. And this is a complete change of pace now. Second Corinthians, chapter five. Verse nine, therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. Life, death, he says, whether I'm alive, whether I'm dead, I have one ambition. If I'm free, if I'm in prison, if people around me love me, they're stoning me. I have one ambition. And what is that? To be pleasing to him. You see, it's not about being brave. I learned this a long time ago. Something that has helped me more than anything else. It's not about being brave. It's about being wise. You say, what do you mean? All right, let's say there's a man and he's. Six foot six, 250 pounds, full of muscles, MMA star. And he says, if I don't do what he says, he's going to beat me up. That's frightening. Now, let's say the stand beside him is a man that's 10 feet tall, 600 pounds, full of muscles, the greatest fighter in the world. And he tells me if I don't do what he says, he's going to get me. What am I going to do? I'm fighting the smallest of the two. I may be scared to death of the smallest of the two, but I'm still going to fight the smallest of the two. I can look at men and be afraid of them. And still keep going forward. Why? Because I'm more afraid of him. He's bigger than they are. They can kill my body. He can kill my body and cast my soul in hell. So I don't like that language, then you don't like what Jesus taught, because that's exactly what he told his disciples when he was telling them, you are going to face horrendous persecution and trials. But let me tell you this, don't fear those Romans, don't fear the mightiest army on the planet that the world had ever known. Don't fear them. Fear the one who can not only kill your body, but cast your soul in hell. And Paul says this in verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, he's not talking about salvation here, but he is talking about a genuine, true judgment that every believer will face. And I want to be honest with you, I can't put the two things together and I've not found a theologian who can either. There are some things in Scripture that we must hold in attention. If you are a believer in Christ, the smallest, weakest, 
believer in Christ, you know that a wide open door is left for you in heaven and that when you cross over into glory, Jesus didn't die so that the first thing you see from him is a scowl on his face. You know you will be received. You know you will be loved. Yet at the same time, the Bible teaches clearly, and it was enough to create reverence and fear in the heart of the Apostle Paul. He said, I am going to be judged. In verse 11, he says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Many people misinterpret this passage. They think it means Paul seeing these lost men here and how they're in such great danger. He's going to go over there and tell them the truth, regardless how they respond. That's not what he's teaching. Paul is teaching something completely different. He's saying. Knowing the fear of the Lord and knowing that God's going to judge me. For how I respond to them, I'm going to go to them and I'm going to preach the truth, even if they stone me. Do you see the difference? So we must be a motivated people. And how are we motivated? We are motivated by understanding the greatness and the glory of God. We are motivated by understanding what God did for us through his son, Jesus Christ. And then there is also each and every one of you will stand before God on that day. I can't tell you how many professors come to me and they'll they say, you know, they have this student, several students who don't do the work throughout the semester. They're going to flunk and everything else. And they all come at the end of the semester. Yeah, prof, can you give us a, uh, you know, some work, uh, some makeup material, maybe write a report or something. And most professors do that today. Mine never did. No, you're gone. There's not going to be anything like that. There's really not. You're going to stand before God one day and you're going to be judged, period. No replay, no backup, no give me a little more time. Can I turn in some extra homework? None of that exists. You will be judged. And as a believer. You will be judged. Now, let's go back to to Romans chapter 12. Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, there's one thing I try to tell young preachers all the time. Yeah, preaching is not just about the communication of information. That's not what it's about. That's not the goal. That's a means to the goal. Goal is transformation. And that's why preachers not only tell you things that are true, they beg you to listen. They urge you. They push you. And that's what Paul is doing here. He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, by what God has done for you in Christ to do what? Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Now, there's something very important here, the word present, and I really want to nail this, guys. We all know. That even when we're striving to do our best, we know there will be failure, we know there will be a need for brokenness. But I want you to understand something. This word present is an aorist tense. And he's not saying he, what he's not, he's not admonishing us like, you know, in some churches, they have altar calls every Sunday and every Sunday you go up and rededicate your life and rededicate your life and rededicate your life and start over again and over again and over again. That's not what this text is teaching. This is kind of a, a prophetic moment here. Remember when the prophet came to Israel and said, how long will you limp between two opinions? If God is God, then serve him as God. If Baal is God, then go with Baal. And that's the call that's being given here at this moment. Stop it, he says. Just stop it. One day you're hot. One day you're cold. One day you're this. One day you're that. One day you're in. One day you're out. Stop it. 
for once in your life, commit yourself. You say, but how? You know, I've sincerely, I, I do that, but, but, but if sincerely you do that, then after you do that, sincerely do this. Start studying the word of God as though your spiritual life depended upon it because it does. Start studying scripture, scripture. Listen, young people, listen to me for a second. It's my job. I write books and I preach. That's all I do. But let me share with you something. It, it's not uncommon for me to be working in the scriptures, writing a book for 10 hours, 12 hours a day. But guess what? If that's all I do, I will grow weak. In the mornings. In the evenings. Sitting down and feeding upon scripture simply to nourish my soul. Starting in Genesis and working all the way through the book of Revelation and then starting again and again and again, feeding upon the word, reading the word, studying the word, meditating upon the word, memorizing the word, obeying the word and being broken when the word is not obeyed by me. You, you have no sense of of Jewish piety. There's, no, there's nothing of Jewish piety apart from the word of God, the law of God, true Jewish piety. And there's no Christian piety apart from the word of God being absolutely center in your life. There is none. Forget it. I don't care how zealous you are, evangelistic you are. You can just go down through a long list of all your virtues. But I can tell you this. If the study of the word of God is not front and center in your life. You're weak. You're weak. You're weak. You're weak. So he says, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Now, he uses the word bodies here, which is kind of unusual. Soma, a physical body. Why would he do that? I don't know, but I'm glad he did. And here's why. You walk up to someone, they, they profess faith in Christ. They're walking in the world. They're walking in ungodliness. And you try to address the matter in their life. And they say, oh, quit judging me. You don't know what's in my heart. I don't need to know what's in your heart. It's written all over your body. What's in your heart, what you're doing with your body tells me what's in your heart. And so he's not saying here, oh, do this romantic kind of philosophical thing in which you, oh, I give my heart to Jesus. That's not what he's saying. You see, in, in the in the biblical view of mankind, he's not all these Greek divisions. You get everything or nothing. If you have truly given your innermost being to Christ, it is going to be reflected in your outermost being, your body, in the way you behave, in the way you act, in your desires, your ambitions, your goals. It will be reflected in that. So he says, Stop with all this silly nonsense and cliches about hearts and feelings. Deliver yourself over. To God, give yourself to God. Now. Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Living. The idea here is this is not just some empty religious ritual. This cannot be done in the flesh. A person who is not a Christian cannot do this. This is a person he's talking to people who have not just prayed a prayer, who have not just made some decision at some sort of youth camp. 
or evangelistic meeting. He's talking about a group of people who have been born again. And that word is so overused and abused. What it means is regenerated, that the spirit of the living God has made them a child of God, has transformed their stony heart into a living heart of flesh. They're responsive to God. In college ministry, I've so, so often it's terrifying. Why? Because you'll invest so much in a guy or a girl, invest so much time in everything else. But you begin to notice that if you don't ask them about the Bible, they don't study the Bible. If you don't ask them about prayer and prod them to pray, they don't pray. If you don't go and get them and bring them, they won't come. And sooner or later, you realize that you're not dealing with a person who's spiritually alive. A person who is spiritually alive will respond to God's call. And when they find themselves wavering, which we all do. They hate that wavering. It brings contrition to their heart. It's a living sacrifice and it's a holy sacrifice. Dear young people, listen to me. I, I really I, I, I try to comprehend I know what kind of world, at least I have an idea of what kind of world you're living in. I know how how corrupt things were when I was a young person. I can't imagine what it's like today, but you can't you cannot throw this holiness thing out. Every time I bring up holiness in a youth meeting or something, usually the response is, well, that's legalism. You need to understand something. The Bible has commands. And if you think that's legalism, then then you don't. Well, you don't have anything to do with the Bible. There are things that God loves and we are to run to them passionately. And there are things that God hates and we are to get them out of our lives. We are to get them out of our lives. Leonard Ravenhill was an old preacher from years and years ago from England. And he sent me a track one time when when he heard I was a young man, I was struggling. He sent me a track and the track basically said this. Others can, you cannot. And what did the track mean? Well, he said, listen, if you want to truly be used of God, then others are going to be able to do things that you're not going to be able to do. If you want to be an instrument that God can use, you have to draw a line in the sand and not cross it. There are some things you cannot participate in. There are some things you cannot watch. You cannot listen to. You cannot be a part of. A holy instrument unto God. It says, offer, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Acceptable to God. Acceptable. You, you have to make a choice, even as a Christian. Anything. Anything. That is a. Stumble. Anything that is an obstacle between you and your relationship with God has to go. You know, I tell a lot of people this and it makes them mad, but I said they they go, man, I just. Why can't I go farther? And I say, well, maybe because you really don't want to go farther. Maybe because if you go farther, it means you're going to have to let go of some things and you don't want to let go of them. There are things you cannot do. There are places you cannot be. There are things you cannot watch. Without grieving the spirit of God. And quenching the life of the spirit within you. You have to realize that the problem is. And, 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 and listen to me. We, you've already heard our one of our pastors praying for other churches. We believe there are other churches around here that are really, really good and things like that. We're not the only group. That's for sure. We've got our own problems. But listen, you sit in most churches. They're never going to talk to you about holiness. Because it'll chase the college students away. Just recently, I, I saw a sign and I looked at it because I was like, what is this sign about? Because the only thing I could make out with my poor eyesight was these big words, fun. 
And so I, I came near the sign fun. What, what kind of fun? It was a church. And the biggest word on that sign was fun. I didn't see Jesus Christ anywhere. I saw really good music, they said. I saw really good times. I saw a lot of beautiful people with smiley faces. I didn't see Jesus. I didn't see cross. I didn't see holiness. I didn't see anything. Just fun right in the middle of it. Brothers and sisters, young and old, that's not Christianity. If we have ever a sign in this church. And there's some other word other than Jesus Christ, that's the biggest word there. I'm tearing the sign down. I'm not even going to ask for permission from the pastors. I'm just going to tear it down and just await what comes. But I know this, I'll have to climb over the pastors to tear it down. No, this is about Christ and about giving our lives for him and giving our lives for our brothers and sisters in Christ and giving our lives even for people who hate us, giving our lives for four billion people who have never heard the gospel, giving our lives for the glory of Jesus Christ. Well, I'm going to stop. But let, let me just let me just say this one part here. It's your spiritual service of worship is the way the New American Standard translates it. It could also be your rational service of worship to give your life. To God. To Christ. Is the act of worship. And it's rational. The word can also mean rational. It is the most rational thing you could ever do is to give your life lock, stock and barrel to Christ. Now, let me put a caveat on this. If any man, any group of men, any preacher or any church comes to you and says it is rational and spiritual for you to give your life to us, run. Run as fast as you can. I am a preacher of many, many years. I've preached longer than a lot of you have even been alive. A lot longer. But men are men and men are fallible. You do not give your life to men or preachers or even someone like the Apostle Paul. Or a group of people like a church. Oh, give your life. Turn it all over to us. Run. You give your life to God in a personal relationship with God. His son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. And in that you will be committed to people. You will be committed to other believers. You will faithfully, hopefully attend a church and be a vital member there. But it is rational to give your life to only one. And I have to say that in this day and age. Where there's so many dangerous things being taught. No, college students, you don't give your life to a man. You give your life to the man. Jesus Christ, and you radically follow him. You can respect ministers. If they're worthy of respect, you can show honor to whom honor is due, but you give your life to only one. And that is Jesus Christ. Well, I got through one verse. Very sorry. I beg you, I beg you. Give your life to Christ. And you young men. I didn't even get to the part that I wanted to teach you, and that is this. Look, your generation, your culture is never going to prepare you to be a man of God and you ladies, a woman of God. But neither could my culture and generation do that. But the word of God can. And following the example of Jesus Christ can. This is not about becoming John Wayne. It's about becoming conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. 
It's not a strength of muscle or steel in your backbone. It's the strength of loving Christ, and Christ loving you and you loving others enough to live and tell the truth before them, even when it's costly. If there are any questions, I will be here after the service. The pastors will be here. But I hope that God's dealing with your heart and drawing you closer to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. So much, Lord, so much in your word. Please help us. And Lord, help especially the young people here today. Strengthen them. And make theirs a glorious generation that serves you. That the grace given to my generation might be superseded by the grace given to them. In Jesus' name, amen.